going to be fun to celebrate today and try to celebrate well. And we just want to welcome everyone here, and especially the uh, extra band. Just thank you so much for coming to help us celebrate this Easter well. Uh, I do want to prepare people, right? There's a lot of different traditions in Easter, and, and depending on where you come from, different things happen. But I really enjoy a good bass solo. Just where, like, out of the music, the bass player just goes off. And so I've sort of asked them to do that. I don't know if they're actually going to do it because it's sort of hard to fit in. But if at some point the bass player just goes off, just know it's fine. It's fine. I will sit here and be happy to sort of embrace it a little bit. Um, no pressure to work that in at all. But <laughs> uh, um, So there's also this tradition, and we'll see if you guys are, are, are trained to this, but there's just a, a call and response for Easter, right? And it is, he is risen. Oh, a couple of you know it, so this is good. So, so maybe, but we can learn fast and catch on, right? So he is risen. All right, that was a little better. We'll, we'll try one more. All right, he is risen. Not much better. I heard that very clear. Uh, and then in like the Southern Gospel churches, like the best Easter sermon ever was really just one line and got everybody excited. And the, the, the sense is this, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. So if I say it's Friday, like, so we're gonna try this again, it's Friday, right? So those of you who don't understand the calendar, on Friday was the crucifixion, on Sunday was the empty tomb. So in case we're like theology and calendar don't mix. So, uh, so it's Friday, Oh, so you guys are going to trick you again. One more time. It's Friday. All right. So hopefully we can have some fun as we celebrate and we go from darkness to light, from lamenting to having hope. Um, and that's going to be a part of today's service. In the back, on your way out, if you didn't grab them, there are some gifts that people from the congregation have sort of added in. Uh, Mike and Lori ordered a bunch of little tiny crosses that you can keep in your pocket or put on a keychain just as a reminder. And it says, let go and let God, and you're welcome to take those with you. Um, and then in the back, there's also all sorts of seeds. We had seeds that were given out uh, for Peggy's mother-in-law, always had a garden and made her own souls. And so part of her memorial service was seeds for everyone to take with them, and there's some left over. And as we are celebrating spring, and again, moving from lamenting to celebrating, take some seeds if you have a garden, plant them, and see what happens with new life. Celebrate that process. So there's a whole bunch back there, so please take those with you. And with that, we will have our call to worship and our scripture reading this morning. It's up here. Would you please stand for the call? I do want to mention that there are three bags here, and um, they are in honor of Lisa's mother, Carol, and Deb's mom, Doris, and um, Velma, Gary's, Gary Cox's um, mom. And so we've been remiss in getting those out, but happy Easter. Please join me in the call to worship. We give thanks to you, Lord. For you, when we were walking in darkness, you were there. You were there. When we were kneeling in weakness, you were there. You were there. When we drew near feeling worthless, you were there. You were there. When we were needing forgiveness, you were there. You were there. When we were searching for your grace, you were there. You were there. We give thanks to you, Lord, for you have done. The scripture reading today is from Mark 15, verses 8 through 24. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. 
Pilate spoke to them again. Then, what do you wish me to do? <clears throat> a man with a call, the king of the Jews. They shouted back, crucify him. Pilate asked them, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole cohort. And they clothed him in a purple cloak. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him. Hail, King of the Jews. They struck his head with a reed, spat on him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, that means place of a skull, and they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. May God bless the reading of his scripture. Please be seated.
We started last week with Palm Sunday talking about Hosanna, which means praise save us. And eventually we get to this empty tomb where we cry out hallelujah. And hallelujah literally means praise the Lord. But in between Hosanna and hallelujah, so much happens. And the crowd actually begins to chant something else in between. See, they wanted a savior. And so they, they, they were hopeful that Jesus would be everything they hoped for. But as you've caught on in this series, and we've been talking that Jesus does things a little bit differently. And so eventually the crowd was a little bit disappointed because Jesus wasn't doing the things they wanted Jesus to do. He wasn't doing things how they wanted to do it. it things that were out of their tradition, out of their norm, out of their understanding, and they became resistant to it. And eventually they decided, this isn't working out. Let's start over. And so the crowd in response, what should we do with this man Jesus that you claim to be king of the Jews crucify him I don't like it, I don't like what he's doing it's not making me comfortable it's different, I may have to change and I don't like that so let's kill him and start over and we will hope for a different savior to come and that's part of the challenge as we look at Easter Sunday um, we didn't hold a Good Friday service here, and so just wrestling, how do we get through all of this? And we will move from the crucifixion to the empty tomb today, but we have to talk about the crucifixion a little bit. Jesus wasn't the Savior they wanted, and so people's response, and, and I started thinking through even just, most of you have probably experienced change at some point in your life. Um, as a church, we have a pretty significant change coming, so this is fairly relevant to us. But how do we actually respond to change? Do we find ourselves resisting it, right? This Savior coming in the form of Jesus, it just was going against their hopes, their traditions, their religious understanding. It was upsetting their culture. And they simply resisted it because it wasn't familiar to them. And what I want to challenge us as we look and we move from, from the cross to the tomb, from lamenting to hope and celebration, is can we be open to what God might be doing in your life? Change is coming for our church. Are we open? that God might be doing something new. I don't know, and anybody remember DC Talk from like the 90s? They had this really kind of hip hop song, God is doing a new thing. I thought about trying to sing it and decided to spare you from it and figured it'd be too much for Steve, but, but it was this constant crowd to remind you God is doing a new thing. When Jesus came to, to Jerusalem at this time, bringing him in, he was declaring, we are going to do a new thing. It's not going to be like the old thing. It's going to be different. And are we open to it? Can we stand before God as things change and say, okay, God, I don't know what entirely, and I may not entirely like it, but uh, I want to be before you with open hands and receptive to whatever you might be doing. It's a curiosity because one of the pieces is we don't actually know what he's doing. Like, we, we have the benefit of time. We can look back in history and go like, oh, this was the early church. Oh, this was the book of Acts. None of that happened yet. And so as this change is approaching and, and we're in kind of the challenge of people being open to something new, it's, we don't know what that is yet. And that can be scary. Moving to a new city, taking a new job. Being open to God and working to reconcile relationships um, that, that there may be legitimate grievances in. Like that, that is this new thing, but it's it's unknown. And so when we are not certain of what's going to happen, how do we respond? Conscious leadership, if you put up the next slide, there's 
group that does a lot of development for, for leadership and nonprofits, and they argue that there is this line, uh, and they simply ask this question, where are you? Are you above the line or below the line? And our you know, primitive brain, our survival brain, makes us operate below the line like 80 to 90 percent of the time. That is typically our default. If something different comes, I'm like, is that a threat? Right? And for a long time, when we were primitive and running around with clubs and all of that, spears, that was beneficial to us. It kept us alive. It provided safety. It, it guarded us. And so this, ooh, that's new. Is that a threat? Is beneficial. Sometimes. But to actually move above the line takes a conscious act to say, oh, what is this? I'm actually going to be open to it. I'm going to be curious about it. And I'm going to commit myself to learning. What might this new thing be doing? The opposite response is to be closer. Well, that ain't how we always sing that hymn. We ain't never had a flute in here before. I don't know about this. I don't, maybe we have, I don't know. But, you know, we're just, it's, it's new, and so we instantly want to close ourselves off and protect ourselves. We, we are defensive about it. We, we come up with our theological arguments, our traditional arguments, our cultural arguments. This is not the way we've always done it. This isn't in the hymnal. It's not in the book of discipline. It's, it's whatever, you know, not the way Grandma cooked it. And we get so set in these. It just, this isn't in my notes at all, but there's, there's a story, and I may have told this recently, but um, family getting together for a holiday, and they're putting in the pot roast. And uh, there's a new member of the family who, who's just putting the pot roast in the pan, and people are upset because she didn't cut the end off. They're like, oh, you have to cut the end off the pot roast. And they're like, well, well, why? Well, because this is the way Grandma always did it. And it became this big to-do, and they're having this argument, debating about it. And finally, they get a hold of, like, the oldest person in the family, and like, isn't it true you always cut the, the pot off, you know, the end off the pot roast? And they were like, well, the only reason Grandma did it is because her pan was small. The pot roast didn't fit in. And so it became tradition, and it became law. And anything that was different or unfamiliar, the whole family was opposed to it because it's not the way we do it. But it was sort of nonsensical. The only reason she was cutting it off is her pan was only so big, and the pot roast needed to fit in the pan to go in the oven. And are we resistant to things? When Jesus came into Jerusalem during Holy Week, and he, he challenged the teachers of, of the law, and he, he cleared and tossed the tables in the temple, and, and just changing things up, people were resistant. Well, that's not what we're used to. We don't like that. And they, this is how it's always done, and they began defending themselves. And what often happens in tradition and things we hold to is we are far more committed to being right than we are committed to learning. And so as we look and we move from lamenting to celebrating, as we believe that God might be doing a new thing in our lives as, as we will spread out from this place, are we open? Are we willing to say, okay, God, what's next? And I've even heard it a few times today, like, oh, I'm an old dog. I can't learn new things. But that's a commitment to being closed. That's a commitment to you being right. That's a commitment to you sort of defending what you know because the pot roast has to be cut off. But can we, as we look at Easter, as we look at this empty tomb and we move from the crucifixion to this symbol of hope, can we say, okay, I'm open. Maybe God still wants to do something with me. Maybe God wants to restore some relationships and make them more meaningful. Maybe God wants me to do something, actually, to step in and volunteer somewhere. There's this old lady at uh, a church that I used to be a part of in Olympia. She, at the age of 65, decided, I know that's young for some of you, it's the chuckling over there. Uh, at the age of 
of 65. She was a professional, lived in the Northwest her whole life. At the age of 65, she had um, some missionaries had come and talked about the needs for children's stuff in the Philippines. And she decided, I'm going to go to the Philippines and start an orphanage. And she started going around and she started raising money for it. She started working with local churches and she went and opened an orphanage. She didn't start until she was 65. Is it possible that God might be able and willing and interested in doing something new in your life, even where you are right now? That perhaps you are not too old, Perhaps you are not too set in your ways. Perhaps you are not long for this world, so it doesn't matter anyways. Whatever it is, and I know we have some young people too, but it's okay. Is it possible to be open, regardless of your age or your situation, and just to be curious? What might God be doing? And am I willing and committed to learning about it? I've never run an orphanage before. I, I'll learn how to do that first if I think that's where. So there's, there's effort involved. But can we move from the cross where we shouted crucify because Jesus was not doing things the way he was supposed to be doing? At least to some. Even though it's prophesied in scripture and they taught him one up, regardless of all that, it's a whole other debate. But he wasn't doing things that they were familiar with. And they crucified him. But this is also great because death is supposed to be final. And Jesus is like, I'm still not going to do things the way I'm supposed to do because I'm going to raise from the dead. I want you to understand the power of God to transform what might be normal, familiar, structured, regulated, to do the amazing, the abnormal, the miraculous, that in fact it may confuse people and confuse the church. I don't know what's happening, but sometimes there's excitement. Oh, what's going on over there? Is there an excitement that actually draws you? Let's go find out. I hear this Jesus of Nazareth didn't stay dead. Let's go and we read in the book. Let's go and figure what is that about? What is happening? What new thing might be taking place that can actually give life and hope and meaning and redemption? Jesus is so good at taking that which is broken and sort of mending it and repurposing and making it something more beautiful. And perhaps right where you are, God is saying, I still want to do something amazing in your life. Would you be open to it? Would you be open to maybe sitting uncomfortably with an empty tomb? What do we do with this? This isn't normal. God, you want me to go where? Mm. Oh, you want me to go and apologize to that person who's been a meanie head to me forever? I don't know. They should come to me and apologize. Perhaps God is desiring in your life right now to do something that you thought was impossible. To restore things that you just thought were broken forever. But God is so much about not doing what is normal and expected. And can we embrace, embrace this possibility of whatever is new and scary because it's unfamiliar? And can we embrace it as being open, curious, and committed to learning? We're going to do things a little bit different. Deb, if you would come up, we have a second reading and scripture uh, call today. Um, it's just hard to get from Friday to Sunday in one passage text. So would you stand with me again for a second call as we make this transition and a second reading? This reading is Mark 16, 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go anoint him. And the very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, 
who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb. When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white robes sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is a place they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The second call of worship. The tomb is dark, but empty. The stone has been rolled away. The burial clothes are put aside. We've been talking about the duality of the human mind, right? That we, we either need it to be this or that. We are either lamenting, we are in sorrow, or we are hopeful. But lament is, is the space of both sorrow and hope simultaneously. And these early disciples, as they approach this empty tomb, as they're embracing this thing that's new, it says they were amazed and terrified. Isn't it amazing to be terrified? Like, this idea that it's not one or the other, that even as, as we talk about this idea of being open to God possibly doing something, we go like, oh, this is amazing and scary at the same time. And it's okay to be both. Our minds, our Western mind, Western philosophy, it's just, it's just so rigid and like, can't be in two places at once, and yet God, again, doesn't do what is normal often. And the early disciples, as they're embracing this empty tomb, and, and oh, wait, did Jesus say he was going to raise from the dead? I thought it was more metaphorically, but he actually did it. To be able to hold space for conflicting emotion in our exploration of what God might be doing. Can we be open, curious, and committed to learning? One of the uh, interesting things... Um, if uh, this is going to go into human development a little bit, and I don't want to go too far, but spiral dynamics basically says that once the universe starts spinning, it creates this repetitive patterns, and there's nothing you can actually do to break these patterns. The spiral, the, the laws of spiral dynamics says it's it's structured in, and internally nothing can change. And then chaos theory creeps in, and chaos theory says that. It takes a strong external force in order to actually break those patterns. Right? I was even just thinking, of, like, eating habits or getting healthy. Like, oh, well, I want to do, you know, nothing really changes until maybe we have that external report and we get a doctor's note and they're like, or we're trying to make it from the bedroom to the bathroom and all of a sudden we're breathing hard and we go, oh, maybe. <laughs> right? But it's an external disruptor. And it takes something significant to disrupt the patterns that we create in our life. And we have a pattern, this defensive pattern, of being closed, defensive, and committed to being right. And Jesus steps into this universe, doesn't do things according to plan, sacrifices himself as this demonstration of his love for us, and then comes back to life. This is a huge external disruption to everything we understood about God. But it takes this external disruption to almost move us to be able to change. And so again, I'm going to ask, can you be open to the idea this Easter that there is this God that deeply loves you and might be interested in doing some amazing new thing in your life? Are you willing to be open to it? to be curious about it, to be committed 
to learning in both terror and amazement and to hold space for both. Let's see.
Gracious Spirit, I just ask that you would be with the families of all those involved as there is health issues and tragedy and loss. There's a whirlwind of emotions, and I just pray that your gentle spirit would be ever-present with everybody involved. For those in the hospital and, and um, seeking care, that you would just do amazing work, that you would make the doctors and the nurses and their caregivers the brightest and the smartest that they can be this week as they care for them, that they would have insights to do miraculous things, and that as their body heals and recovers, that even the healthcare professionals would just be amazed and not able to explain because this doesn't make sense. And yet we believe that you are a God who can do amazing things. Lord, we pray for Lisa's niece who is stepping into um, new life after treatment and, and to discover what that looks like and to acclimate in a healthy way. We just pray that you would give her strength, that you would give her perseverance, and that you would surround her with amazing friends and family. Lord, we ask that you would be ever so gentle with those who have lost their loved ones. Lord, let, let them remember them well, let them celebrate, let them laugh at the silly things and cry at the sad things. And through it all, we pray that you'd be a God that would just be with them. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me for the reading of our benediction? This is awesome. This is really weird. I'm always late and we are early. And so is it possible for you to play one of the songs over again? Maybe He Lives or just um, after the benediction because we have time? Well, we were going to do some stuff after. Yeah, excellent. And as well as a bass solo? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's, uh, <laughs> I had to ask. Let's, uh, let's read our benediction. Do not be dismayed.
Andrew Perry on bass. Russell Gores on guitar. And Adrian Baxter on flute. Oh, they're done. 